this function? <laughs> oh, there we go. This is just in case I've got to say hello. I've got to hello up here, just so I can what to actually do. Um, connection problem, there we go. Um, so I'm here today just to talk a little bit about uh, our business, um, Zoo Digital. Um, we're going to talk about the power of awesomeness, we'll explain what that is all about a little bit later on. Um, so the plan is I'll talk a little bit about myself because you're a captured audience and I can if I want for a little while, so I'm going to do that. We'll talk a little bit about the business itself, Zoo Digital, who we are, what we do, and then also an approach to what we do with our software and our services that we think is a little bit different from everybody else. So I plan to just take you through that, and hopefully it'll be of some interest to everybody. Um, so as you may have noticed, um, by my very strong Northern California accent, I'm based in the US. Um, I've actually been there 20 years now, and the uh, accent doesn't seem to have moved very much. In fact, um, one of the great things about working over there and having an accent is by default, you probably get the coolest accent in the room at any meeting you can go to. <laughs> People also seem to think that um, you're more intelligent because you've got an accent, so pretty much whatever you say, they seem to believe, which is actually quite handy as well. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> to my everlasting shame though, there's a few downsides to it. A couple of times I've been there at one checkout of a grocery store I was at, the actually, the woman actually asked me to say some lines from Braveheart, which I actually did. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife was there and it just went badly, to be honest. So, uh, <laughs> There's a few other things about living and working in America that is great uh, as well. Um, the use of the word reach out, I don't know if you guys do this over here, but my God, it drives me insane. And as this says, if you're a member of the Four Tops, it's absolutely fine, but if you're not, please stop saying that. You're either going to email somebody, or you're going to phone them or text them, just use those words, that's what they're designed for. So that's one of the things I don't like. Another thing I don't like is having to order a tuna sandwich. You cannot order a tuna sandwich by saying tuna. You have to say tuna or you will never get a tuna sandwich in your life. So those are the two main downsides. So it's not that bad overall, I think, to be honest. So back to the power of awesomeness. So um, Zoo Digital, we're a company based in the entertainment capitals of the world, Los Angeles, London, in Sheffield, and uh, <laughs> you can see where the connection came there. It's definitely entertainment capital, it's somewhere up north, I don't really know where it is, but um, and we provide services all around, you know, showcasing people's content, localising that content and distributing that content as well. And today we just want to take you through um, a few of the ways that we go about that, basically. So at our heart, we're actually a software company. We started off a life as a software development company and developing products as we go, and products for this industry. We've been doing it for a long time, close to 15 years now. Um, and so we actually have proper software set up. We've got software developers, system engineers, cloud engineers, project managers, product managers. And we build all of these products with that group of people, all done in-house. We're also a proper production facility. So we actually provide all those services I mentioned before using these tools that we build. And actually, rather than just a happy coincidence, we think today that's actually the best way to work is if you're building the software that you're then going to use to provide the services. And um, one of the reasons we think that's a good thing is this dog fooding. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I might be some weird thing that people do, but in our context, it's actually a really straightforward thing. It's the idea behind software companies using the, the software that they build on a daily basis. And so you have that feedback loop where you are production guys and using the software that's built by our software guys that are 30 feet apart in the office and we make sure that we build it for real life problems. So when we build a software, it's actually built based on what happens in day-to-day -day production. And we found that really helps us build better products as we go. Um, we have this view of the world that it's zero defects. You actually started my career way back as a, a semiconductor engineer. And when I left college, joined a company called NEC that makes semiconductors at that point in time. And they had this way of working that they kind of taught all the engineers that joined them, was this idea behind zero defects. It's, it's you know, one of these things they try and achieve, very difficult to achieve, but they go about it in such a way that if there's ever a defect in anything that gets manufactured in a semiconductor plant, the engineering group, the production group get together, figure out what went wrong, and then put steps in place to make sure it wouldn't happen again. So it's really trying to focus on what went wrong, how do we fix it in the future, 
and they keep monitoring that and keep doing it. And it's just relentless, they do it all the time. So anything that ever goes wrong, they keep doing that. And that's the approach that we've adopted from what we do. Um, we're always looking at what's happening in terms of our software and the services that we provide. And if we get a rejection, we do something about it so that doesn't happen again. Simple example, a couple of years ago, we got a rejection from, might have been from Sony, I don't think he's from Sony's here, but anyway, we got a rejection from Sony for inconsistent use of ellipses across multiple language streams. So we figured out, well, let's go see what went wrong, basically. And we discovered it was just a tech QC guy who missed it. It's one of these easy things, he just missed it. But because we work in cloud-based systems, which is effectively just a giant database, we designed a test that would make sure that our system would test for inconsistent use of ellipses, suck us that up to our guys, and we've never had that problem since because now the system's helping us do that. So this kind of zero defects approach is, a, you know, we apply that to everything that we do. And we found it really helped us build the products that, uh, that really work. Oops. You don't want to go over there. So you might have seen some of the content we've got out there. We talk about awesomeness, project awesome. So the idea behind this, to give a bit of backstory, was you know, we built the six products that we mentioned before, and all those products are designed for a particular task, whether it's subtitling, or whether it's um, project management software, or whether it's packaging software. And we got to the point where we could see we really needed to do a bit of effort to join those products together. So make them all work together because, you know, the landscape is getting more complicated in terms of the number of SKUs that people have to handle and the amount of languages they have to handle. So, um, like any good project, it needed a name. Uh, so we spent quite a long time thinking, what should the name of the project be? And then one of the guys had mentioned this concept behind nominative determinism. And I'm pretty certain to put that slide in there just to see if I could say it, which I did okay, I think, actually. For those who don't know, and I never knew it first either, the idea is that your name, whatever you're called, can actually shape your character or what you end up being. So you can see here, Sarah Blizzard was destined to join the BBC uh, weather service. <laughs> it was just going to happen. So off the back of that, we started thinking a little bit differently about the project name. So we thought, well, we probably shouldn't call it Project Trap because that wasn't the outcome we were shooting for. We decided not to be British about it and call it Project OK or project, I hope it's all right. So uh, we just went for it and called it Project Awesome because that was our goal, is to build these awesome tools together. And so we have this, uh, you know, this landscape of our, our products all working together on a single platform. So uh, we set off down that road. Um, and I like to say it's transcended a project to become a philosophy in the business, which sounds a bit, you know, maybe a bit contrived, but it's actually not the case. We've really started to focus on what do we do that we can, in our products, they can make it awesome for people to use it. And that's actually what we've seen. We've seen over the years as we've had people use our systems, and we've demoed it to them, the word awesome keeps coming up. And it's actually not the big things about the system, it's the little things that we find. It's when we deploy a piece of software, we show someone, hey, you know, you can log in now, here's your dashboard, you can see all your projects going, you can see all the milestones that it's hitting as you go. And so for someone, that is actually pretty awesome because it just makes their life a lot easier. Or you know another piece of software where they can log in and they're maybe looking for a particular subtitle file. They can go in, they can search on it, find it themselves, download it themselves, so fulfill whatever they need to do, or even do a conversion themselves. So for those guys, that's pretty awesome as well. So we've kind of taken that that that's the way we try and build our products. Is always thinking about what a customer is actually doing, what makes their life easier, and makes everybody's life easier to work together basically. So what kind of took us down that road is we just saw a lot of changes in industry. It wasn't that long ago, um, still today. This is not doing well, this little thing. We were just making these. So people were making discs, DVD and Blu-ray discs, and we were building SKUs on that. We were doing bit budgets, we were putting languages on those. People were shipping them around the world. Today, it looks more like this. Everybody's still doing DVD and Blu-ray discs. But now all these other platforms, bit budgets have gone, people can go at it with as many languages as they, as they want. And what we found with a lot of customers is they're still doing this with roughly the same number of people they had before, sometimes slightly more and sometimes even slightly less. So for us, when we saw this, it became very apparent to us that technology was going to play a big part in it. Technology has to help lift the weight. You know, you can't just rely on people to do this alone because when you get to something that's complicated and the number of SKUs you're running with, the number of builds, the number of languages, technology has to play a big part in it. And so we get a big believer in that, obviously, because of our background. 
So what's your approach? What did we do different, or at least we think we did different from everybody else? Um, so the big idea for us was that we were going to make sure that, well, over the years we've built lots of systems and we discovered pretty quickly that one size doesn't fit all. You can build a, you know, a big monolithic system and it won't work for everybody. And everybody needs something slightly different. So that's why we started building the products out in the individual things, but then wanted to join them together. The other big decision we made is that we wanted to share our technology with our customers. So by default, if somebody works with us, we deploy all our software for them, give them complete access to it, and actually don't try and hide behind the technology. Because we found it's only by working together that we actually make this more efficient for all of us. And um, the other thing we also really you know, looked upon was we're only just part of a big ecosystem, so you know, as we supply services here around localization, there's a whole lot of other things happening there as well. So we also spent the time and money building APIs around all of our products so that it could integrate with our customers' products as well. And we've actually seen some customers don't care, they don't want to do it. We've actually seen a lot of other customers really start to embrace that. And so we've got customers today who they'll place a work code in one of their systems, they'll pass all the information over to our system automatically through API calls, It'll set the priority, it'll set the delivery date, it'll pass us all the source material. We get notified, we go off and do our work. We hit the button when we're finished, and it passes it all back. And so for those guys, they found this very, very efficient way of working. And in fact, we think that's probably the future state, is that that's the way people will end up working, is making sure that systems are talking to each other and taking a lot of the heavy load out of people having to do these things manually. So that was a big thing for us, that um, we wanted to make sure that we shared as much as we could with our customer base. And I think that's different in the past from what it's done. You know, it's been a bit of a black box. If you send product to someone to process for you, they go off and do their thing, and at some point in the future, you get your product back and you owe it some time. And we want to just be very transparent with that whole thing. Everybody knows that's the one constant that's changed. You know, so a process you put in place today won't be the process you need tomorrow of a different process you need next week. And so again, when we designed the systems, rather than design it that it has to be, like I say, very strict in the way that it operates, we designed it in such a way that we could very, very quickly change the way these things function and change the process that it follows. A good example might be, for the people involved in the subtitle would be Translator Credits has come up recently. I think not <coughs> so we have to worry about that much. And not even Translator Credits, but then Translator Credit Waiver Forms when they don't want to have their name appear in the Translator Credits. So you just think of it that, that's on every single stream that gets processed, that's, you know, that's a big admin task. You know, for us, again, because we, system, you know, we run systems for this whole thing, it was very simple for us. We just had one of our systems, ZooSubs, if it doesn't see, Translate credit in the stream, it notifies our uh, system for accounts payable. And when the translator tries to put their invoice in, it just pops up the translator waiver form that they have to sign to put their invoice in. People are always interested in getting paid. And it just sort of takes care of itself. So for us, actually, that what could have been a horrible admin overhead for us just disappeared basically because we've got the software systems that we can use to do that. So we wanted to make sure that we build all our products out that way, that it really, you know, we could change them on the fly. Other big thing that we did was we embraced the cloud. It was really obvious to us that, especially if you look at localization, you've got people around the world, you know, working simultaneously, different time zones. You needed a centralized system that everybody could be working on at the same point in time. The cloud gave us that. We also wanted to get away from people having to have pieces of software on their desktop or downloading, you know, uh, proxies from FTP sites. So for us, everything sits natively in the browser. It's all HTML5, there's no plugins. So when our translators go to work, they just log in in a secure environment and can get on with it. But equally on the other side, as us and our customers, because they can see our systems, everybody can see the process flowing through. You can actually see milestones ticking through this whole thing. So the cloud is a, you know, we're a smaller company, gave us the ability to scale to these kind of levels off the back of what we can do with people like uh, Amazon Web Services. The, so the cloud's fantastic, I'm, I'm a big fan. The worst thing they did with the cloud, in fact, though, was, um, call it the cloud. It's a terrible name, you know, it sounds highly insecure. You know, stuff could blow away. You should have called it the Iron Fortress, the impenetrable object or something like that. So when we, we started using it like five, six years ago, we were talking to people about it and people are just, well, what cloud? Is it your cloud, or my cloud, or somebody else's cloud? But I think now we're in a state where people actually have embraced it. It's, a, it's an ideal way of working and there's a lot of benefits that everybody gets out uh, of, you know, adopting that as a platform. 
So these guys, are, I like to call them the enemy within. Um, <laughs> it's just a nightmare. We are slowly but surely eradicating these from our business. Um, it drives me absolutely insane. Uh, people like to manage projects using these systems, uh, well these systems, <laughs> these products. In fact, I would add another one in there, I'd put Microsoft Outlook in there as well, because that's obviously, most people like to use that as a project management system. You know, for me, these are, this is not like data, you know, people send, oh, I put it in a spreadsheet, I sent it to you. Well, as soon as somebody sent it to you, it's instantly out of date. Um, you know, there's a thing that's really good, really good at that stuff, is databases, they're pretty cool, you should, we should all embrace them. Um, so in our business, we have tried whatever we can to eradicate these, and if actually we find someone managing a project with one of these products, we've actually went to threats of mild violence, basically. And, you know, I've told them, I will turn up at your desk, grab your pinky, and bend it back really far, and it's going to hurt. Um, if you don't believe me, we've got a few zoo people here today, but just look for the ones with little bandages on their pinky. You know, those are the offenders that use Excel. So we've been eradicating these wherever we can. There's a place for them, but not in managing projects and not in managing projects you know, of, of you know, good size. So you know, what was the point of doing all this? Uh, you know, why did we go spend the money on the engineering side, build out the production groups, and figure out what we were going to do? So to go back to, again, from a background in engineering, you know, when you put systems in place and processes in place and train people to do a certain thing, you're looking at a couple of things. How can what you build scale? You know, so today you're making 100 widgets or 100 subtitles or 100 pieces of uh, web and file. Um, but what if you want to build, you know, make 10,000 or 100,000? What does that look like when you scale the whole business up? And then the other side of that is actually when you do that, what does your quality look like? Do you have all the systems in place to make sure the quality stays where it should be? The yield, we call it in a, a manufacturing environment. So we actually monitor these things. You know, it's something that's really important to us to understand. What, what is our software bringing to the party here? Um, and so for this, this is a little graph we've got, which is basically, uh, it's for 2006. On the top, in the black line, is the, um, the increase in assets that we were producing through our systems. So we increased it by about 350%. So just the volume went through these systems uh, went up threefold. The red line at the bottom is our headcount. How much we had to increase our headcount to actually support that level of volume increase. And so that to me is a pretty good result. It tells us our operational gearing is really good. The software is helping to carry the load that you can actually process much, much higher volume um, without having an equal, equal number of people added to the, uh, the, the equation. So on the second side, on the yield, um, we also monitor that really closely because anybody that's ever dealt with Netflix knows we all live and die by our, uh, our metrics nowadays. So over the same period, we, we increased the volume over threefold our first time acceptance rate sat around about 98%. So it never really moved. So for me, that was a, a sign that with all the stuff we've put in place, the safeguards we've put in place, the software and how we operate as a business, was doing its job basically. Um, so yeah, so that was the result that we got. Um, that's pretty much it for me, actually. In fact, we'd like to hear. Uh, I have, uh, would like to encourage to go outside and take a look at the demos we've got in there. Uh, we've got it man 